Surprise. <laughs> We're gonna build this Lego set today. We're gonna build this today. <laughs> yes. Wow. Some of this generation feels that they have lost that trust that college is worth it. How do you restore that trust in the general public and in the next generation that is coming up? Welcome to Gator Bites, the official podcast of the Maryland Davies College of Business. I'm your host, Miguel Gomez, and with us today we have Dean, Dr. Jonathan Davis. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. We're so happy to have you here today, and uh, congratulations on becoming the new Dean of the College of Business. Thank you so much. This has been a big time coming, and I'm really excited to dive deep into who you are as an individual, but also learn more about what is your vision for the College of Business. Can't wait. So, to begin, tell us about yourself. How did you go from student to dean? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think I had the faculty part of this in my mind for a long time. When I was an undergraduate, of course, I had a faculty of, of different backgrounds and types and quality levels, just like everyone does. Um, and everyone has their favorite when they go to college. And my favorite was such a good teacher, so inspiring that it made me realize that I wanted to do that for a living. And that was when I first decided I, I wanted to be a faculty member. And, you know, time passed and I started a career and, and I had that in the back of my mind. It's kind of this, you know, itch that I, I, I thought I wanted to do. So uh, in my late 20s, I decided to go back to my, get my doctorate and um, ultimately ended up here at the Maryland Davies College of Business. And I, admittedly, at that point, I had no notion at all of ever going into administration, let alone being a, a dean. Um, and anytime anybody brought it up, I said, oh, I would never want to do that. Uh, but, but what you realize over time is that, you know, as you, as you build uh, competence, as you build understanding of what you're doing and the impact that you're having in the world, you realize that, you know, sometimes the system, the, the place you're at needs you to step up and do that next thing so that everyone can, can move forward. And that's what I discovered. And uh, over time, I've just learned this and added a piece of that and over time realized, well, I guess I could do this next thing too, couldn't I? And, and uh, eventually I realized that, you know, I, I can do this. And, but at each step of the way, it was always about how, how can I have the best impact with what's been given to me along the way? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, asking that question of myself over and over again has led me to this point, interestingly enough. How, how can I do the best for, for the world with what I have and what I've been given? I think two things come to mind whenever you mentioned that. One, the idea that it seems like it didn't start off with you wanting to become Dean when you were in your 20s. When Not at all. That, that wasn't your final end goal. That was, yeah. that was a different time for you. But as time went on, it seems as though you made the best out of every situation. And there was sort of like this undercurrent of a servant leadership. Something called you to do more. Would you, would you say that that's something that sort of drove you at each stage? No, I think that is true. And it's, it's um, you know, a little bit of a, um, you hear a lot from people, what friends when they're interviewing, when I like to say that I'm a servant leader. But, but before I had heard that term, I think I had had that mindset because, you know, when I became a, eventually a department chair, I, re I realized very quickly that my job was not to be in charge. My job was to protect the faculty and by uh, association with the students from things that could have been coming their way to derail them from the work that they were really there to do. And to me, I was serving that most important thing we do, which is converting students into graduates who then change the world through their work. Wow, and now you're at a very interesting point where you've now just been named Dean of the College of Business. I have to ask you, why did you want to become Dean of the College of Business here at MDCOB? Well, I think it's the same answer to the question of why did you want to come here at all? Um, to, to come to this college means that you have recognized the opportunity that we have in this college as staff and faculty to impact the world in the ways that this university is uniquely positioned to do. We are changing lives in ways that I don't think I did when I taught classes at Purdue. We're working with people who uh, have been disadvantaged in life, they have economically disadvantaged in a variety of ways, maybe their uh, education system up into college hasn't served them well, and we have this opportunity to convert uh, that into 
change in the world for the better. And that's what inspired me when I first got here, when I wanted to come here. And at every step along the way in my career, as I've taken kind of a, a role as chair or now a role as dean, it's about how can I maximize that opportunity because I see it as a responsibility. And I want to follow up with that. You know, what do you foresee the future of MDCOB under your leadership now that you've stepped into this role? It, it feels as though they're really big shoes to fill, but you have to start the path with one step at a time. Yeah, it goes back to that last answer about a responsibility to fulfill an opportunity, right? Um, the, the work that has been done, you know, they always say you stand on the shoulders of giants and, and I'm standing on the shoulders of all the people from 1974 all the way today who did the work along the way to build us in, into the opportunities that we have now. I have to be that person for somebody in the future, right? And, and, and what will that per future person who sits in my office wish that I had done? They're, they're going to wish that I had identified the, with the faculty the various things that our students need a way into and put the pieces in place so that we can now f fulfill that opportunity as well. So, for example, uh, a year or so ago, we, we um, put in, I think, the region's first and so far only undergraduate uh, major in human resource. It's gone off really well. The enrollments are rising and the students in that program now have an opportunity to really target that field in a way that they couldn't and differentiate themselves from students from other universities in the region uh, in a way that we couldn't before. And every time you put something like that in place, you're building one more piece of structure that you're creating to support students and their success. I also want to give a quick shout out to the Human Resource Organization on campus, Sherm. Uh, they did really good this year and they won an award as an organization, but also we interviewed them yesterday oh, great. on the podcast. So nice. uh, this all comes full circle. Um, you know, if you are thinking about going into human resource management, you know, think about our new human resource management major. UHT is the place to be for that. There you go. Well, um, I want to ask you something a little bit more fun. Okay. Um, you know, I asked you in preparation for this interview today to bring your favorite Lego set. You know, I understand you have a love of Lego. Um, Tell us about that and, you know, walk us through the set that you brought us today. Yeah, so my love of Lego is, is true. I, I've never really been a Lego aficionado. So those of you out in the world who really are, forgive me for, um, you know, being a pretender here. What I'm really a lover of is logistics mm. and supply chain management. And so if you go into my office here on campus, you'll see things like this uh, throughout the room. And each one of them is a different kind of... Uh, vehicle designed for moving cargo mm. and uh so this one this is one this is a, a, a lego model of a maersk container ship one of the earlier smaller ones um not very many teus for those of you in the field but uh, i love it it's it's a, it's a beautiful representation of um kind of you have to squint a little but it's 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 a perfect representation of a of a, of a modern container ship uh, in the last 40 years so I have to ask what is a TCU TEU uh, sorry 20 foot equivalent unit so that's how it's a measurement for each, each one of these containers is roughly two TEUs a 40 foot versus a 20 foot 20 foot equivalent unit and in terms of size like how big do these ships get they get extremely big uh, the very largest one there's actually a, a version of this model of, of a much larger one which for, for a time was the world's largest the Emma uh, by also by Marisk. And that one was roughly 18,000 TEUs, which would be about 9,000 of these 40 foot containers, which is just an incredibly staggering amount of cargo. That's mind boggling. Uh, I can't even picture the scale of it. To die, it's, when you're in the presence of one, you really don't, you can't quite process it. But uh, the, the, the most modern ones, I think, are on the order of 22 or 23,000 20 foot equivalents, so roughly 12 to 13,000 containers. In your time in supply chain as um, a higher education professional, uh, did you ever get a chance to actually visit the port and actually see these ships or like these modes of transportation in person? So it has been very uh, rare and unusual to be able to get to go actually into the terminals at the port hmm. uh, for security reasons, you know, since 9-11 and other, other events. However, there was a special event a few years ago. I did get to go and take a bus tour where we could see the, the enormous cranes that are each $250 million and, and uh, some of the incredible equipment they have. And 
part of what I love so much about the field is exactly that. It's, it's like you're, you're a kid in the bathtub with big toys, toy boats, you know, it's just that, that kind of mindset that, that harkens back to your, your appreciation for big things, doing big work in the world. Uh, it, there's a sort of a pure um, mentality around that. And, and I, I enjoy that part of the field. You know, this is a little bit related, but also unrelated, but like, I've seen that they also ship cars through freight over shipping containers like this. Do you know anything about that? Well, there's a lot of different ways to ship cars and freight. So one of them can be a container ship. A container, a 40 foot container would, would, would fit several cars and you can ship them that way. Um, but the most interesting one I think is what they call a row row ship, a roll on roll off uh, ship where you literally have a a port on the, on the side of the boat with mm -hmm. a ramp that extends down onto the actual uh, key and, and, and whatever vehicle you want, be it you know, Volkswagens or tanks or whatever, can simply drive up onto the ship and the interior of the ship is essentially like a parking garage. Oh, wow. And you drive around the parking garage up the level until you find a place to stop, you park it, tie it down, and there you go. The really interesting thing about that is vehicles are different heights. Mm -hmm. Some of them are tall, some of them are short, makes no sense to have a bunch of same sized levels like a normal parking garage yes. for regular cars. So most of those ships have levels that will move up and down within the ship to size the height of the level to the vehicle they're actually moving. No, that's wild. So like they can actually control the height of the of every parking level depending on the size of the vehicle that they're shipping. Yep. Wow, that's amazing. So it, in theory, could you ship a Formula One car? Absolutely. Well, I'm yeah. glad you said that because, <laughs> surprise, we're going to build this Lego set today. We're going to build this today. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's um, incredible. You know, I just I just wanted to take a second to just you know, build it. this with you. And so, you know, we got you this uh, Formula One race car from the Lego City set. If you want to go ahead and just open Love it. Love it. I'm opening yeah. it now. Do you ever watch Formula One? I have watched Formula One on occasion, yes. You know, the one thing that I figured that might be of interest to you is the logistics of like, Formula One. Um, yes. I hear that it's more labor intensive than just putting it on the boat. They have to work internationally uh, and ship it through air and they have to move fast because there's a lot of races throughout um, yeah. throughout the season. I hear each race is essentially a project. I love that. Right? I love that. So so you know, this is a this is a perfect side, you know, this is a little mini project. You know, what is what is the first step in completing a project like this? Wow, like this? Yeah. I think that you would be to do an assessment of the uh, materials and the people and the, the knowledge about the project itself so so in a sense <laughs> don't just open and rip it and read the instructions first yeah I mean, <laughs> that's the right thing to do i mean those of us who've been kids and played with legos how many of us read through the instructions first before we got started that might be a small number <laughs> uh, would you say you're a pro at building legos if you didn't have the instructions no no no, no you, you gotta have the instructions walk me through Managing a project of this scale. So okay. let's catalog the parts. All right. Sounds like we're going to have to do some sorting. Yes, it does. So I'm going to open my set and make it available here. This is usually where you start when you build like really big Lego sets. You know, what I find when you build really big Lego sets is your biggest problem is finding the right piece at the right time. Uh -huh. So it's, there's an organizational element, which you're actually accomplishing right now, <laughs> that I think is crucial to yeah. a project of this of this scale. Let's 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 get organized. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing it. We're getting organized. Okay. I guess the green parts are related, so we can kind of have the greens near each other. Uh, the little helmet with the helmet with visors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. These other parts seem like they're body parts. Okay. So we've got this nice little uh, Formula One body. I'm not sure if it's uh, compliant with the Formula One standard, but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend. There can be some stickler sometimes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'd say we've got the parts uh, fairly well organized. Uh -huh. So uh, you've got the work instructions. So what do the work instructions say past the In building, the of, building the figure. of the people? Okay, so we got the figurines. Oh, okay. So we we're gonna have to build our trophy. That's that's the first one. Oh, let's start with the trophy. That's yeah. a good way. It's like eating your dessert first, <laughs> just in case something happens. It, it appears it's this piece and this piece and, and this then piece. a flat piece. All right. So one, two, and then three. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work, as oh. they say. You know how how important is it to communicate during a project? 
I actually had a conversation about this not an hour ago with somebody about how you can learn all you want about project management, creating timelines and doing a critical path, thinking about uh, about the, the mechanics and nuts and bolts of the project. Mm -hmm. But when I was teaching project management, which is some years ago, I would always say that that part of it is about 30% of the work. Mm. And the other 70% of the work is people. Mm. Communicating, motivating performance, motivating a buy-in on what you're doing, getting their input, uh, just just communicating. I feel where that, that buy-in is the most difficult part sometimes. Because you could have that million dollar idea, but if you don't have the support of the people that you need the support from, it won't, I feel like it won't go off the ground. It, a project of any size, I think that's the case. I mean, if, if you've got to rely on others to be successful, then, then the, your main job as a project manager is to to be a people person and lead the people. Well, uh, that, that can be challenging sometimes too. It can, and, and the, the unfortunate thing is many project management courses will default to just sort of the math, the math of project management or the, the, the tools of project management. In fact, this piece of it is it's really where it's at. The people side, you know, as we're building the little figurines. Yeah, exactly. What are some of your ho other hobbies? Do you like photography? I do like photography. I haven't had a lot of time for it recently, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, no. Um, but yeah, I've always loved photography. My undergraduate major was journalism, in fact. And so oh. part of that was the photojournalism piece. Okay, um, I, I don't mean to date you, but when, 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 when did you take that photography course, that, that journalism course? I won't say except to tell you that it was in film. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white film, I, slide film. I, you know, I love that because, uh, you know, at some point in my academic career, I spent some time at Houston Community College and um, one of the classes I had a chance to take was uh, in film photography. And great, that's was, a great skill. It was in one of the last wet labs in, I think, the whole state of Texas. Did you develop film in a wet lab? I, yeah, in a wet lab. We, with the dark, with the red light, and you're rolling the film onto something and drip dipping. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. A, very transferable skills for the 21st century. But <laughs> I will say that everything you learn about being a photographer yeah. as, a, um, as a film photographer translates to, to now, which you might think is strange, but um, hmm. seems to be true. Is it that one? I mean, we've got this this thing here. Okay, let's see. It seems it's like that kind of hangs off the back a little bit. Like I, said, I can start seeing it come together. It's beginning to look like something, if not a card. Okay, and we got some two red amber ah, okay. uh, clear pieces right here. So those are gonna go on either side. You wanna take one and I'll take the other? All right, I got you. <laughs> okay. Right. Wow, this is really coming together. If only every project could go this smoothly. Those will all be doing great. So oh, we're really breathing through it. I'm not gonna lie. We're all almost thirty pages in at this point. Wow. So this is gonna go binding those two together. And then this one goes right behind as well at the bottom. Yes. There you go. So this is beginning to look like sort of a vehicle. You know, just out of curiosity, you know, you mentioned uh, supply chain. Uh, what's your favorite mode of transport? Oh gosh, it's like asking which is your favorite child. I mean, which, you know, casting back to that, you know, child enjoying the toy boat. You know, every one of them has that that feeling for me. The big train, big truck, yeah. big. You know, if you forced me to pick one, I think I would say uh, water transport. Water transport. The big boats. Yeah. Uh, what are we gonna break that down? Because I actually want to hear more about that. All right. All right. Okay. Let's see. Okay, and now we have the number of the car. That's nice. Looks like uh, and this thing here. Let's see. Oh, I see. It's part of one and the same. And then two of those. Two of those. The small ones. So this is going to go. And then it like, looks like they're inverted like as well. Yeah. Sort of like some aerodynamic, uh, some some cunards. I, I think that's what they call them. Maybe stabilizing feature. There you go. Some sort. I'm sure you've done a lot of case study reading, but like, what are some instances when people haven't done quality control and it's come back to bite them? I mean, there's a lot of instances you can throw out there. Um, off the top of my head, the ones I can think of have, have usually been about misunderstanding reality a little bit mm. and not re-interrogating what you think you know mm. along the way. That's the quality check. Now, there are always you know, the simple mistake kinds of quality checks as well. But those to me are less interesting. You can build in um, quality checkpoints and really uh, take advantage of simple tools to fix those. 
the hardest ones are ones that are exist because of a, a policy or a mistaken understanding about how the world works. And that that's that's fascinating to me. Like, like which one? Well, the one I'm thinking of, I did a. Um, the uh, company tried to fill up a boat with the product that it had on hand, and they thought they had ordered the boat to the right size, uh -huh. and they filled up the boat entirely, and there was still product left over on the on the dock, yeah. and they couldn't couldn't move forward. And learning why that had happened and how not to do it in the future was exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the understanding how something called stow factor works when you're pouring, say. Legos, for example, Legos would be a great example yeah. of something that if you pour it into a bucket, it fills the bucket. But if you shake the bucket a few times, those Legos will settle, yeah. leaving more space for more Legos. That was the issue on this boat. They hadn't factored that in. So this is called the Stow Factor? Stow, stowage Factor, yeah. Spelled S-T-O-W. Right. Oh, I learned something new today. Yeah. Nice. All right. Looks like we're approaching the end of our build. We're right there. We just need a pit crew to put some tires on. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think we might just be missing, just adding the wheels in. I think we might have just had two, three extra pieces. Yeah. On the up chance. Most Lego sets, I think, do add, for yeah. some reason. All right. We'll add two. There you go. All right. I've got two more to add, and it looks like a vehicle that <laughs> I, I i'm so glad that this all came together i really wasn't expecting to do legos with you today <laughs> this, this has just been so much fun um well we have a nice little grace driver and somebody to capture the moment just like yeah. you and your team do so often yeah no shout out to ricardo saint and victor henson as well as diana cervantes and new characters mangeta they're always out and about getting the shots with our digital communications. Yeah. yeah. And shout out to you for hosting for almost two years now. Two There's seasons. Two seasons. This uh, this program and building it from nothing into what it is now. No, it, it, it's been a long time coming and it's what allowed us to be able to sit down today and just take an afternoon from the crazy hustle and bustle of the College of Hustle Absolutely. to build a Lego set. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting I didn't have that on my calendar today, but I love it that I did. I'm glad. I'm glad. Hopefully